Jaren Schneider here with Imaging Resource, and in this video, we're going to take a look at two Fujinon lenses, the MK 18-55mm T2.9 and the MK 50-135mm T2.9. I love equipment that seems to relish in its own superiority. Great optics, the best cameras, spectacular audio equipment. I'd be lying if I didn't just love the creme de la creme of camera gear, even though I preach that you don't really need it. And that's still true, you generally don't. But when you can have some truly spectacular stuff, it's really nice to have the opportunity to use it. Or better yet, own it. That's how I feel about the two Fujinon cinema lenses for X-mount and E-mount cameras, more specifically, X-mount tested in this review. The Fujinon MK 18-55mm T2.9 and the Fujinon MK 50-135mm T2.9. Just holding these lenses feels like luxury, and affixing them to a camera rig is just pure, unadulterated gear porn. I went into this review knowing, not guessing, that the optical quality of these lenses was going to be amazing. It just was so unlikely that they were going to be bad that even thinking they weren't going to be near perfect seemed like blasphemy. And that's pretty much how I feel now after using both the 18-55mm T2.9 and the 50-135mm T2.9. Both these lenses are, overall, incredible examples of optical technology. So much so, it's a real shame that they are only compatible with the X-mount and E-mount cameras since I would love to have these on Panasonic, Canon, or other popular video camera formats. For this review, both lenses were tested on the latest firmware for the Fujifilm X-H1. Since these are cinema lenses, only video is captured for the purposes of this review. Fujifilm did something really special when they designed the 18-55 T2.9 and the 50-135 to T2.9. The design of the lens will be familiar to those who've used cinema optics. Geared rings for focal lengths, focus and aperture, as well as marked points for multiple different focal lengths, apertures, and focus distance, which allow for easier and more accurate adjustments while filming. The lenses themselves, though large, are not particularly heavy. That isn't to say that the metal build isn't sturdy, which it is, but somehow Fuji managed to create a lens that not only has great image quality and a full metal body, but did so without making it weigh too much. For an optic of this size and quality, the 2.16 pound weight for both lenses is reasonable and pretty light. Both lenses, were you to ignore the markings on the side of the optics, are physically identical. Both have the same weight, width, and length, and both focus and zoom entirely internally. That last note is of particular importance, as it is critical that the space a rig takes up and the balance of that rig not change when shooting motion pictures on sets. You don't want to be worried about that when working with a number of moving pieces as a set requires. To be expected, all three dials on the camera are de-clicked for smooth adjustment and operation, and the smoothness of that operation needs to be stated. Each dial moves freely and smoothly, but with just enough tension to allow for fluid yet accurate adjustments. I mentioned in my review of the Fujifilm X-H1 that the camera itself isn't really tuned to be what seasoned video shooters are looking for, and I stand by that opinion still. The camera itself doesn't have the feature set or usability of a full-time video camera. But, if you pair it with these lenses, you'll find that the optics are never going to let you down. Even as much as I was frustrated by the X-H1, I was soothed by the lenses. It should be noted that the Fujinon MK 18-55mm and the 50-135mm are both fully manual lenses. There's only enough electronics in these optics to communicate to the camera what their current settings are, and that is it. It goes almost without saying, then, that as with all dedicated cinema lenses, there is no autofocus. To use these lenses effectively, you're going to have to be comfortable with a fully manual shooting workflow. In my opinion, there really is only one drawback with these lenses. They are only available in Sony E-mount, the older version of this lens, and the newest version which we tested here for X-mount. And it should be noted that when shooting on either mount, it will only cover the Super 35 format and smaller. That means you won't get the advantage of the full frame look of a camera like the Sony a7R III. For Fujifilm, videos are already only captured in Super 35 or smaller. That's a bummer, because the quality of these lenses is exceptional, but not being able to use that full size of a sensor is a disappointment. Additionally, the Fuji X-mount is not a particularly widespread mounting format in cinema, so it's kind of a letdown that the other mounts are not available, such as Canon, Micro Four Thirds, or even PL. It should also be mentioned that these lenses require a set or a set piece, as they are not run-and-gun lenses. I do want to spend a bit of time on this, because anyone transitioning from the stills world to video might find this a bit jarring. Motion pictures generally require a lot of 
pre-production and setup time to create great visual pieces. So with these lenses, know that a videographer's workflow slows down considerably when compared to using a still lens to shoot video. This is a cinema lens, and the expectations that come with that should be evaluated before you make a purchase. Both these lenses exhibit some truly excellent image quality. Through my shooting tests in various environments, I noticed no chromatic aberration whatsoever, even wide open. Very little to no vignetting, likely due to firmware specifically designed to reduce this in the X-H1. And outstanding sharpness at all focal lengths and from wide open to nearly fully closed. On that last note, if you look closely at the lens performance through its aperture range, you will notice a couple things. Firstly, through most of the aperture range on both lenses, the images produced are incredibly beautifully sharp. Looking at footage, I have to say that I was impressed with how good the quality of images was from the wide open aperture of T2.9 all the way up to T16 on both the MK18-55 and the MK50-135. to Only at that point and above T22 did I start to notice diffraction take place and sharpness quality slightly falter. The biggest drop off is at T22, so if you really wanted to, you could still shoot at T16. It is my opinion that videos captured with these lenses look the best at T2.9 through T5.6, due mostly to the beautiful depth of field and pleasant bokeh. It certainly helps that the images captured are also crisp and sharp, but I still smile when I see the smoothness of the out-of-focus areas and the transition to them. Speaking of the bokeh, or bokeh, however you want to say it, it can be best described as perfectly circular, which isn't necessarily what you find in other cinema lenses. A more hard-edged bokeh is somewhat more common and lends a certain look, so if you're going for that, this lens may not be the best choice. But if you're going for a more totally soft, full blur kind of look, this lens delivers. also come with a macro switch at the neck of the lens which allows you to get a bit closer to subjects and properly focus. The closest you can get with this lens is about a foot and a half away with the 18-55 and about two feet with the 50-135 to even with the macro mode activated. This isn't super close but it's nice to have as an option especially if you find yourself in a tight shooting situation and need to buy yourself an additional foot of space. To note, the minimum focus distance of the 50-135 to is 3.9 feet and the 18 to 55 is 2.8 feet if you are not using macro mode. Finally, I noticed a no image quality degradation when using macro mode, so you should feel free to use it without any concerns about losing quality. I highly recommend both of these lenses together as a set since they so well complement each other. Since their weight and physical profile are identical, building set pieces around these lenses is a piece of cake and allows your camera operator to interchangeably use whatever he needs for a shot without worrying about upsetting any balance or spatial restrictions. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that these lenses are not very expensive. The 18-55 is about $4,000, while the 50-135 comes in at about $4,300. With both lenses covering 18 through 135 millimeters, that's a great focal range capable of T2.9 throughout, but that's also a lot of money for those who aren't serious about cinema. For those that are serious about cinema, that's actually really affordable. They're almost cheap for cinema lenses. If you think these are worth your dollars, then you'll be thrilled with their capabilities. T2.9 is wonderfully wide open and creates a beautiful out of focus area without sacrificing sharpness or image quality. Colors pop, details are crisp, and the lenses themselves operate wonderfully. Fujifilm has made two really great lenses here for a price that's extremely competitive in the cinema lens market. It's a shame they're really only available for Fuji and Sony E-mount. However, if you're a Fuji shooter getting into film, these are an absolute must-buy.
For more on Fujifilm and other cameras and lenses, keep it locked to imagingresource.com.